Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Michelle Morgan, and I uh, have been here for many years in the athletic department. Uh, I've coached. Can you see? I'm a bit short, so may, maybe you need to sit back a little bit. Uh, uh, I've been here for 38 years, and I coached five different sports while I was here. Um, I'm still here. Uh, I just retired from coaching last May and have been on sabbatical this past year, um, and I'm entering phased retirement coming uh, this fall, which I'm very excited about. I've been in... <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my arm has been twisted a little bit to come back into some coaching um, as we have a new golf coach coming in, and I've been asked to do some mentor coaching, so um, I still say yes instead of no. <laughs> I'm really excited about this. I, I wish there were more people here. Uh, I want to thank Rick Murphy, who's the pre right here in front, who's the president of the Friends of Amherst Athletic Association. And at the end of this, I will allow him a couple of words to give his little pitch about membership in that, which is really important to our athletic department. Um, this year, I've been on sabbatical, and I've um, bravely attempted, and not well, I will admit, uh, to delve into the history of, of women's athletics. And you would think that being here for 38 years, um, it would be easy, but the aged mind um, is not as good as it used to be. And so I've, been, I've spent quite a bit of time in the archives uh, this year. Uh, and surprisingly enough, and maybe not so surprisingly, the history of women's athletics and athletics in general is not very well recorded until the, uh, the age of computers and uh, websites. Um, so it's been a tedious task. And, uh, you know, I, I discovered, well, it jogged my memory to remember uh, firsts, first teams, uh, first championships, uh, first All American honors. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. But the more I read about that stuff, the less important it became to me. That came to me. And when Rick and I were trying to decide sort of how to put this together today, uh, what I've always been passionate about, and I think those of you who who uh, participated in athletics here, um, it, it's all about the Amherst student experience. And so we decided to. Um, asked some of uh, the reunion classes over a broad range of, of classes to come and share their stories. This is very relaxed. It's open conversation. I have some lead-in questions, and it'll be interesting to see what uh, has changed, if anything, kind of a stupid comment to make, uh, from 1981, actually, uh, I'll get to 76 in a second, to uh, 2016. And I have to uh, say thank you to all these panelists, and particularly to Brianna Cook, uh, who is a, uh, a five-day-old alum. <laughs> I'm going to have each one of them introduce themselves in a second. But uh, before I do, um, why are we doing this this year? Well, this is the 40th anniversary of women's athletics um, intercollegiate programs at the college. And I will now correct myself that it's actually the 41st, OK? Um, back in the fall of 1975, uh, Craig Riley, who's the class of 76 and is actually here, um, not yet, uh, to celebrate his reunion, uh, was um, begging the athletic department and our a lo our longtime uh, head coach, Hank Dunbar, of the crew program, not to uh, stop offering the crew program during Craig's um, final year uh, because Hank was going on sabbatical for a semester. And so he begged to uh, allow the athletic department to allow him to become the coach for that, that uh, first semester. So in that fall, um, as I think is custom, Bill, maybe, maybe not, Bill Steckel, our, our, our crew coach now, uh, he, was, he was recruiting uh, some of the back then called freshman men 
to join the crew team so that they could train as novices and eventually move into varsity boats. And so he's hanging up flyers in the, uh, in the dormitories. And uh, there were some women on campus. They had a women's dormitory. Um, we had some transfer students at that time and some 12 college exchange students uh, who were, um, there weren't very many of them. And, and if you ask me statistics, I, I won't remember. So I talk in generalizations. Uh, so he decided that it didn't matter what gender uh, he was looking for bodies to ensure that he had enough people to fill a boat each practice. So he decided to put some flyers up in the women's dormitories. And lo and behold, uh, there were a, a few women that were brave enough to say yes, and they began rowing that fall with the, with the men's team. Uh, they, let me just tell you what their names were. Uh, Helene, uh, Helene Racist from 78, uh, Mary Gooding from 78, Leslie Labossiere, who was a 12 college exchange student, and Krista McCarthy um, were the first four. And once they finished the fall uh, uh, semester, they became very enthusiastic about it and started to recruit some other women. Well, there weren't very many to recruit from, but they did come up with a couple more, Anne Whitpen um, and um, uh, Kathleen Marshall, uh, who joined the, the team in the spring. So the, 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 their, the first fledgling team started in the fall of 75, and that spring we had the first intercollegiate competition for women when uh, they were joined by actually some Smith and Mount Holyoke women to fill out the team a little bit more. But when they had their first race, they decided that it's just going to be Amherst women. So the five women uh, uh, rode against the Syracuse University Club uh, in their first intercollegiate competition that April. And as one of them uh, said in one of the student newspapers, she said, we blew them out of the water. So, in fact, we are uh, 41 years old in a way, but this is a, a, the beginning of a celebration uh, of, the, of the 40th anniversary. So, with that said, I'm going to ask each one of the panelists to introduce yourselves, your class, what sports you played, and briefly share one memorable athletic experience, disappointment, athletic disappointment, uh, achievement, why it was important to you, and why it's remained in your mind for several years and Brianna for a couple of days. <laughs> I'll start okay. with you in deference to your seniority. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> it's all about age. Um, uh, Amy Skilbert is my name. I'm class of 1981. A lot of 81s here. Thank you. <laughs> um, I began by playing tennis when I came to um, to Amherst and I was the number one tennis player and the captain of the tennis team because speaking of needing bodies, bodies were needed. And um, then I played squash, I played lacrosse, I picked up a lacrosse stick for the very first time my freshman year because again, you just needed, you know, you needed people and they had to be women at that time. So. Um, and then the second year, I switched, and instead of squash, I skied on the ski team, which was a co-ed team and a, a lot of fun. We had, a, we had a terrific time for three years of skiing, and it wasn't as intense as what sports are these days. It was a fair amount of partying and a lot of good times. Um, most memorable experience is um, playing lacrosse. Um, it was a new sport for me, and I had... Um, I came with no skills at it. I'd played field hockey in high school, had been on a very successful field hockey team in New Jersey high school. And I knew I had to run on a field and, and what to, where to go somewhat. But lacrosse was very different. It was more like basketball. And when we started, um, I remember that we just got beat pretty soundly. Yes, isn't, Ted's are nodding. I need some <laughs> verification of my memory on some of these things. Yeah. And it was, yeah, it was ugly. And I think the other team sort of like, yeah, we got to get on the field and play Amherst, you know, the women at Amherst. But by senior year, and I had, um, there, were, there were actually some standout 
lacrosse players of the women in, in my year and the year ahead. And um, they were the core that were training us and teaching us and helping us learn how to catch the ball, throw the ball, what we were supposed to be doing, very patiently too. And by our senior year, we were successful. I, I said to someone else, I don't remember whether we actually won games or not, or, or we how we few. did. So, but, but we were decent competition. And so that was the, you know, that was a big turning point to go from a group who really didn't play. Nobody was recruiting incoming superstars at that time for, for sports. There were definitely good players who came every year, but there was a lot of growing people within the community. And that, was, that always stayed with me. And I took that to coaching tennis for 11 years in Juneau, Alaska, where I live. And just, it's about enjoying it. It's about learning the skills so that you can take it on and, and do it and, f and have fun. So, thank you. Gail? I'm Gail Glick. I'm class of 91. I was Gail Regenstreif when I was at Amherst. I, uh, I was recruited for soccer, um, a little bit by Michelle, mostly by Allison Marsland, who was from Rochester, New York, which is where I grew up and had the good fortune of having her as my summer soccer coach in between my junior and senior year. Um, I also played club ice hockey. It wasn't a varsity sport yet, and I did that mostly to stay in shape for soccer so that I wouldn't gain an, another 20 on the freshman 20 that I had. Yeah, uh, I was really enjoying that ice cream. Um, and uh, I also played softball in high school, but I didn't play in college because I didn't think it was competitive enough, the club level. Um, the, the ice hockey, when I, th when I looked at club, uh, I, I, we'll talk about this more later, but when I looked at club, I, I felt like it wasn't serious enough to, if you were a serious player, to play it. And that's why I played hockey, was like, well, it's just a club, so I can pick it up and, and do it. Um, because my, my older brothers had played hockey and I knew all the rules. It was just a matter of teaching myself how to skate. We'll talk a little bit. Yeah. We'll talk a little bit. We'll like talk that, a little bit more about clubs that, in a, in that a little bit. That was the attitude. And then my, so my, uh, my most prominent memory of Amherst is quite different from yours. It's a discreet moment when I scored the winning goal against Williams at Williams on a really blustery rainy day. It was a one nothing game. It was either sophomore or junior year and I meant to cross the ball to one of my teammates, and, the, and it was really, it was the end of the game, and I was running down the side of the field, and I just had my last bit of energy to put my right foot on the ball and try to cut it back to the 18-yard line, and the wind was so fierce, and the rain was so, that it just carried it into the upper <laughs> corner of the goal. Good spot. It was a thing of beauty. <laughs> um, I'm Rebecca Ginsburg, class of 2001, and um, I, my, my memory of Amher sports is sort of mixed together with, not just with rowing, but with my first attempt at being an Amherst athlete, which was uh, an ill-fated attempt at trying out for the softball team, um, which didn't go well, but was the hardest thing I ever did to that point, and you know, gave me a lot of confidence. If I can try that hard and get that bloody and um, and and all and everything I went through f for the tryouts, you know, I can pick up a new sport. Why not? So um, I tried rugby for one practice and determined immediately it was not for me. Um, those girls were rough. And I gave crew a try, and it turns out no one beats you up, and that was perfect. Um, you know, it it was a matter of me learning how to row, though I had never been in a boat. I had only you know seen a, a, a crew race once in my whole life um, but my coach Bill um, and some other uh, novice coaches walked us through the whole thing and my greatest crew memory is at some point during I think it was my sophomore year being in a four so with four other women um, winning my very first race um, on the textile at UMass Lowell um, it was it was phenomenal. It was something that, you know, it felt different than winning a basketball game or a softball game or a soccer game, which is what I had played in uh, in high school because it was such a direct connection between everything that you put into the boat and that success. And that, I mean, really, crew is a great sport for that reason. So, Thank you. 
I'm Christina Wong. I was the class of 2011, and I ran cross country and indoor and outdoor track. Um, and I have to say, I, I started running cross country my junior year of high school, so I hadn't really been running too long when I got to Amherst. And it was a, it was a rough transition. Um, I was the slowest person on the team my freshman year. Uh, I definitely gained the freshman 10, even though I was running twice as much because of the unlimited soft serve. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was tough. And uh, there's a picture of me like running in the back of the pack for a workout we had on this this course called the field loop, which is just that bird sanctuary loop mm. um, that's down by the bike path. And I remember that workout because I was just trailing behind so far, all of my teammates. Um, so being a senior and going back and being able to do six miles of interval work on that course without you know, being at the back of the pack was, that was like such a huge change for me. Um, so individually, I remember that. Um, I also remember as a team, uh, my senior year getting third uh, at our regional meet um, because we were, I think we were ranked fifth or sixth and it was going to be kind of a stretch for us to, um, you know, get any higher than that. But somehow our team, we all put together really good races and ended up having a, a really good score. So that was definitely really memorable, um, being able to share that with my teammates. Uh, I'm Brianna Cook, class of 2016. Uh, I played softball. Um, my most memorable experiences, the one, but used two. Since my coaches are here, I'm just going to shout them out with it. Um, the conditioning part of uh, preseason softball has been most memorable for me because when I signed up to do college softball, I assumed I wouldn't have to run ever again, which is, which is why I never even looked towards playing college hockey. I was pretty done with it after high school. I was done with the conditioning. But um, Coach Johnson came in my junior year, and that preseason, we had no idea what to expect. We had barely met the woman, and all she did the week before preseason was ask us if we could all swim. Um, <laughs> and I think one girl definitely responded with barely why, and we didn't get much more of an answer. Uh, we got pestered that week as captains to really dig deep into what was going to happen and if we were going to have to drown in that pool that day. No one drowned, so we all passed. Um, that was pretty great. We had to take sweatshirts off over our heads, and without knowing the challenge, I signed up to, to use the sweatshirt of the, the largest girl on the team by far, my best friend. Was like, it's going to be great. We'll use your sweatshirt. We can both fit it. I didn't realize we were going to have to jump in the pool with it and then pull it over our heads. Otherwise, I would have left her on her own. There's just no <laughs> chance. Um, and then this year, so everyone passed, but this year we had to do running. Uh, we had to train for it, and... There were some serious stakes, like if you don't pass, you're not playing in Florida, or you're not practicing um, during the last few weeks we have a preseason. Uh, and we didn't all pass. In fact, only seven people passed the week before we went to Florida. Um, so those seven, or the 12 people we had left were not allowed to practice uh, that whole week going in. Morale was very low, uh, and as captains, we were kind of left with this we didn't get people ready, so what do we do now? Uh, how do we get people to stay in shape for this next week before we start off our season? So that Monday morning, we got up at 5.45, went over to Mount Sugarloaf, hiked a mountain at 6 a.m. to look at the sunset. I don't do hikes, and I don't do anything before 11 a.m., so it was a really big <laughs> day, but um, it was like one of the happiest days I think I've ever had with our teammates, just to see everyone who thought they were like so disappointed and their teammates were so disappointed to really come together and have Dunkin' Donuts at the bottom, well, the bottom, because it was actually closed. It was too early in the season. We illegally, <laughs> we illegally hiked that mountain. Um, but when we came back down to have Dunkin' Donuts at the bottom with our injured teammates, it was just a really great like sense of camaraderie that I'll always remember. So. Now, now I have to run out as a coach she could have thrown you under the bus a little more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Bye, coach. <laughs> uh, I thought we'd take just a few minutes to uh, have me ask a, a few short answer questions. Uh, some of it's on a rating scale, some of it's yes and no. Uh, feel free to embellish briefly, but in the interest of time, these are just short answer questions. Um, and let me see where I am. Uh, on a scale of 1 to 10, did you consider participating in athletics as part of your thought process in choosing to attend Amherst? And we'll start with the oldest. Scale. 
Okay. okay. Scale of one to ten, did I consider athletics part of my thought process? Yes. So probably a ten, but I chose Amherst instead of going to University of North Carolina to play tennis. So it was a choice not to be a tennis player. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, for me, it was a 10 to pick Amherst over a Division I school that was my next choice, which would have been Cornell, to play soccer at a high level but not at the Division I level that would require me to focus too much on athletics and not enough, enough on the rest of the Amherst experience. Mine was maybe more like a 7. I was choosing between Amherst and a, and a, a Division I school where I knew I'd have no chance on the softball team. So, uh, yeah, a little bit, but... I would say about an eight. Uh, I decided I really wanted to go to Amherst um, before I even started running cross country. I thought it was going to play soccer. So um, probably maybe a six. Um, I was choosing between a bunch of D one programs with lesser academic standing, um, and so the academics of Amherst really sold me on coming here. So softball was very important because I was recruited, but um, the academics were the, the was the really final factor. Interesting. Christina, did I try to recruit you or should I have? No. For so soccer? I <laughs> <laughs> no, I was I probably wouldn't have even made the team as a soccer player. Um, I was a much better runner than I was a soccer player. I would have been very embarrassed. <laughs> no. uh, on a scale of one to ten, and I know this is somewhat similar, uh, how heavily were you recruited by the Amherst coach? Zero. <laughs> I think Ed Wall was selecting people who had a proficiency and a depth in a lot of different areas, and he just, I see a lot of nodding heads of women in my class, because you just had to fill out theater and arts and, and sports and all these things. Ed Wall was our dean of admissions Sorry, dean at of that admissions. time. Um, I'm not sure my recruiting experience, I know that I was recruited by Amherst and by you, Michelle, but I'm not quite sure whether I had more than one telephone call with you. I think it was more um, the overnight experience. Again, Allison I knew from my summer in Rochester, and then um, I don't remember a lot of contact until the spring when I, I had applied and was on the verge of getting in, and I think either you or Zoe or Allison called me and invited me to come. It was like siblings weekend and it was an awesome time to come. And that's when I really felt like I was recruited when I came to see Amherst a week after I had gone to see Cornell. And I was able to juxtapose them and it was such a clear choice of Amherst. Mostly, almost, it could have been just because the weather was beautiful and there was, <laughs> there. you know, I looked down at the four fields and I saw a doubleheader baseball game and a lacrosse game, a men's and women's lacrosse game and maybe a rugby It game. wasn't because of me? <laughs> <laughs> it was primarily like because Lisa Salonetti was so nice to me on Friday night when I got there, you know? Um, just all the people that I met and then sitting in uh, the annex eating dinner with people who were, who were not just jocks, who were really interesting, smart people. Um, that's when I realized that it wasn't going to just be an athletic experience and that's what made me choose Amherst over Cornell. Becca? Zero. <laughs> um, five? I'm not really sure, actually. Um, our coach was like pretty hands-off in recruiting, so I think once I started running, I had you know one season of cross-country times and just filled out some form on his website, um, filled in my times, he emailed me. I think that was it, and then my, the fall of my senior year, I emailed him and told him, hey, I'm applying early decision. And he was like, oh, just to clarify, you mean like binding early decision or just you're sending in your application early? And I was like, oh, early decision. And then he said, okay. And then I got my acceptance letter and he sent me a Christmas card that said, congratulations. <laughs> so I don't know what that was, but <laughs> five. <laughs> Um, mine's probably a one, which is also the same number of months I was committed before I was accepted into Amherst. Um, I was dropped from the Cornell recruiting class in August, and I sent over the coach at the time, I sent to Whitney my all my stuff, and she said, no, our class is full. And she emailed me back in October and said, of my senior year, and goes, actually, I would love to see anything you have on video. Um, and so she never even saw me play. I just sent her a disc from a camp that summer, and she was like, great. 
welcome aboard, send in your application. So that was it. <laughs> wow. Sort of interesting. I, I anticipated a little bit of a, a, a different progression in ratings of uh, zero, that doesn't surprise me, yeah. to a three or four, I know that you would have been a zero, <laughs> uh, and a seven and a 10. But that, I think that's really interesting that, that they, they all varied over the years quite a bit and for similar and different reasons. Um, over the past few years, there's been a debate by the NESCAC um, athletic, uh, athletic administrators about the merits of eliminating the overnight visits as part of the athletic recruiting process. And it's all based on the liability issues of coaches, the department, and also the, the student hosts. Um, my question is, and some of you answered it already so you can skip over it, did you make a visit to campus in the college shopping process? And if so, was it an overnight? Just yes or no? Yes, I visited. No, it wasn't overnight. Yes and yes. Yes and yes. Yes and no. Both yes. Yep. Uh, on a scale of 1 to 10, what impact did the athletic portion of your visit contribute to choosing Amherst? <laughs> this is so shallow. Maybe, um, I had uh, someone who gave it, it, no, it's me. I had someone who, um, who takes you around, you know, you go on the walking tour and there was so many people in my group who wanted to know like how many books are in the library. And <laughs> I just did not care at all. I grew up in New Jersey. I had gone to football games with our neighbors who had no kids and we'd gone to the Princeton football games and college was all about big stadiums and you know football games on Saturday and the camaraderie that all the students had when we would go there and you know it was impressionable high schooler middle schooler and um, so then we get to the football field what's it called Pratt Prattfield Prattfield and I look around and I think this isn't as big as my high school football field <laughs> so anyway that's what role it played you know not very much <laughs> Is it a one to ten? Or no. Oh. It played a big role. I mean I I saw myself as an athlete, I still do, even though most people who I know today don't don't see me that way. Um, <laughs> and I love watching sports, I love being part of the sports culture. I also love being part of the, you know, the academic culture, the music culture, the acting culture, whatever. I loved this whole thing, but it was like I said earlier, it was a sunny day, it was like early April, there were a bunch of games going on. Everyone was super nice to me from teams or not from teams. It was like, you know, whether it was people who weren't involved in sports or were, but I would say, you know, it was quite high up there. I really liked the school spirit and how, how you know, athletics was kind of a unifying force with seemingly for the people I was visiting with and that it would be for me. I stayed with a woman who um, who was a rower and met some of her rowing friends, and I, I think it must have made some kind of an impression that they, um, you know, were on a club team and had a bunch of friends through that. Um, um, but otherwise, I I remember more along the lines of just everybody seeming to have a lot of fun together and there being a general camaraderie. Um, not so much about the sports team. Was that visit set up by the admissions office? No, it was my friend's older sister. Mm. I didn't have an overnight visit, and my actual visit to campus was just probably an hour long just for a tour. Um, but I don't know I think the prefresh program is valuable. I mean, I know the people that stayed with me, and I think I don't know how it is on teams nowadays, but. Uh, we definitely like valued that time with prospective students. So, I I mean I definitely remember hosting different people and you know seeing them in like a Middlebury jersey later and being like, Ugh, I don't think we like took her to a fun you know activity or something. <laughs> um, I don't remember it having that much of an impact. I think they had more of a social impact my overnight, and I think since then we've looked at them in, for prospective students as more of a social event trying to see if um, like perspective, perspective students will gel with the culture of the team and we actually had a girl my freshman year who on her overnight it was just a, way too much to handle and we told our coach and she 
it was no longer part of our recruiting class, so she went over to Middlebury, and we still play her. So, it's <laughs> so a little bit of reverse recruiting there. That's yeah. That's interesting. Uh, I don't think any of you, other than Amy, are legacies. If I remember correctly, Amy, your dad was class of '52, played soccer and skied. How much influence did he have on your decision? Um. Not much, although, you know, I'd known he'd gone here, and um, we didn't come up for reunions or anything. He had gone on to medical school, so I think his cohort was more his subsequent education and the people he met there. And um, I applied because my best friend had an application that she wasn't going to use because she got an ED to Brown, and I said, oh, well... You know, she said, no, you really should apply. Your dad went here. You know, like, okay. So it's, it's, yeah, yeah. I'm way glad that this is where I went to school. <laughs> but it wasn't, um, you know, it, it was, it was one of the best schools I got into. And I decided, okay, let's go. <laughs> so. I, my next question was what your, your, um, second choice was for college, which you, most of you answered. Um, I was just delighted to hear that it wasn't Williams. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I recall my days uh, pre-Title IX uh, of competition um, as a uh, uh, the only girl on the boys' uh, little league team. Uh, I grew up with three brothers. Um, I went to an all-girls uh, prep school, uh, and they did have organized sports back at that time. Uh, and of course, you played everything back then. Um, I do remember selecting my number, number five, and um, actually my th couple of my kids have adopted or did adopt when they were competing that number as well, which made me very proud. Um, and I also, my husband and I just purged our attic because we're in the midst of renovations, and we finally decided to throw out his Pingree Varsity leather-sleeved jacket and my white blazer that I was awarded um, on the day of graduation from Dana Hall Prep School in Wellesley as being the best athlete um, of the school. Uh, it took me a while to get rid of it. Um, and I pleaded with him not to. Do, do you remember your, your college uniform number and uh, how did you choose it? And do you use it all anymore? Well, tennis, skiing, and squash didn't have numbers. Oh, that's right. <laughs> and lacrosse had a number. I don't know. Oh, good. Other people are saying I don't know. No, <laughs> I, I don't remember it. Um, I didn't use it. The most memorable piece of wear that I have was the woman's lacrosse team sweatshirt where we spelled woman wrong instead of, <laughs> instead of women. Oh, it was that. woman. <laughs> And it says Amherst College, women's lacrosse team. And people would stop and say, I still have it too. <laughs> whose mistake was that? We are not telling, and nobody knows whose mistake it was. But, um, but people would stop you in the street and say, well, shouldn't you know how to spell that right if you went to Amherst? <laughs> anyway. did, did you say you still have it? I still have it. Yes. Gail? Um, my number was 16, and I picked it because the best player on my high school team was number 16, and, well, you know, the center striker, and I wanted to be the set best center striker. So I, as soon as I could have 16, it was mine, and I think that I came in as a freshman. I don't think it was selected by anyone else, so it was always mine, and I use 16 in some of my passwords. Um, it's one, and it's one of my lucky numbers I play in roulette or in the lotto when I play. Do you still have any memorabilia that was either gifted or found its way into your packing at the end of your four years? Oh, yeah. I, I stole my issue sweatshirt um, with the A and the little numbers underneath, and it's got some moth holes in it, and I still wear it. But otherwise, it's perfect. Um, <laughs> it's like indestructible, because it was part, part polyester and part cotton. Um, and, uh, and I've also gone back sometimes during reunions, and some, some of the issue people have been kind enough to let me steal stuff at various times since the time I graduated. Um, and I also go to Hastings and just buy it now. <laughs> 
Um, so we don't have numbers in crew either, but numbers are very important um, because each of the seats in the boat, other than the coxswains, has a number. Um, and I remember that um, for no particular reason, I wanted to be port because that would mean that I had an even number in most cases. And so I was either eight, six, four, or two, or stroke six, four, or two. And um, and I can't say I use the numbers anymore particularly. Um, as for uh, Amherst gear, I still have my um, my trow, is what we called it, the spandex shorts and and um, and various terrible shirts that we wore. And um, and I often wear my husband, who just disappeared around the corner, his um, 1996 Coxon Amherst Crew sweatshirt because he got it in size giant, and um, that, that will stay with me for a long time. So we also don't have numbers in cross country and track, but we did have a competition number that followed us for four years, and I don't even know if anyone like remembered it or knew about it, um, but I, mine was 428 or something with 28, and I use, yeah, like passwords, stuff like that. Um, and as far as memorabilia, if anyone here in the audience works in the athletic department, I would love an old jersey <laughs> or something from Issue, because um, I don't have anything. I should have stole my jersey, <laughs> but I didn't, which I regret. <laughs> Um, I was, no, I'm number 15, was number 15 now. Uh, I picked it when I was eight and when my mom signed me up for rec softball because I had watched a, a Yankees classic special on Thurman Munson and I wanted to be the catcher, so I picked number 15. Um, and my little sister actually now wears it. She just finished her freshman year, so now she wears it on her soccer jersey at Stanford. And I I have a lot of t-shirts and a lot of sweatshirts. <laughs> we can still get them back. You're not that far gone. Uh, I'm curious about the faculty administration and athletic department support uh, during your time. Uh, I recently reached out to those members of the very first crew team um, as a, a way to jumpstart the next part of my uh, uh, sabbatical project, which is the student athlete stories. And uh, Helene, following their win um, against um, Syracuse in that very first race, um, said that, and quote, she was utterly incensed that President Ward had not attended the first women's intercollegiate sporting event at the college. And the following Monday, she said that she flounced into his office and demanded to see him to express her chagrin. Subsequent to her visit, she said she did receive, or the team did receive, uh, what was a very fantastic congratulatory note. Uh, Ann Whitpen, um, who was also one of those first rowers, uh, said that, quote, rowing at Amherst and being part of a team was very impactful on my Amherst experience. In fact, at senior thesis crunch time, when I said to my thesis advisor, Professor Rose Oliver, perhaps I need to quit crew, and her reply was, if you quit crew, you will never complete your thesis. With that said, um, tell me a little bit about your experience of faculty, uh, administration, and athletic department support. I thought the athletic department and um, did a very good job, the administration, for starting off women's sports um, in the by the nineteen by the class of. 1981. Um, we had a lot of support. We had a good locker room. We didn't know what the men had, but ours was ours was serviced. We we had um, good facilities, incredible you know tennis courts and playing fields and and everything to play on. Um, we had a lot of support from the men in our class and and older as far as athletes um, supporting other athletes. There was a very small um, weight room. And at that point, I don't know how many other women had done weights. I had never done weights. Um, but someone said, hey, you really should do some weights. And so I went in. And people would show you how to do them. Men would show you because they were the one in there lifting weights for football or something, massive weights. And you're like, OK, can I put five pounds on and do my legs? Um, so I thought, there was a, I thought there was a fair amount of support for us. Yeah. Do you remember the wall that divided the men's and women's locker room? Yeah, you could hear through it. <laughs> well, but but what else? 
You could throw things over. <laughs> Don't you remember that <laughs> There's a from, gap. The, from the floor to the beginning of the wall, yes. there was a space like this, okay? And at the top of the wall, there was another space from the ceiling to the top of the wall like that. And there used to be an occasional peeping Tom. These days, <laughs> those peeping Tom... I did not know that. <laughs> the, in those days, those peep, uh, in these days, those peeping toms would be in front of the judicial board, and we just attribute it to boys will be boys. Hmm. Right. Girls were looking over. Yeah. Did it? Did it? Yeah. There, there we go. There we go. But we had one, there was one sauna, and you could, and you'd go and use the sauna, and it would be men and women, and um, everyone was wearing, well, all the women were always wearing t-shirts and shorts, and all the men were wearing shorts, usually. But it, uh, it was, it was, there was a lot of camaraderie, yeah. Um, so, yeah. So well, I didn't know there were people. I forget what the call of the no. question is. Uh, we we're talking about um, the support that <laughs> oh, okay. the right, right, right. faculty yeah. administration and... Um, I, um, like Amy, I felt a lot of support from my fellow uh, classmates, men. Um, the male athletes and women athletes got along really well. We, you know, we did share the same locker room facility, and especially the people who had to go down and get their ankles taped, or you know, sit in those ice bathtubs and stuff. You know, and and Stan and Maria are here, and I really appreciate them as part of my uh, Amherst sporting experience. Um, and I met a lot of um, men and women um, who were athletes through that whole like use of the locker room area and going out to the field. So I really felt supported always by those people and made some good friends that were even outside the team. Um, I didn't feel, and I felt very supported by you, Michelle. I felt like you were a big mentor for me. Um, a lot of my professors were not as supportive of, of the male athletes more than the female. I found that uh, male athletes would kind of get treated negatively in class when they had to leave for a football game or a baseball game. Um, and there were a few professors who weren't so kind to me when I told them, you know what, I got to miss a lecture because I'm leaving and we're driving up to Bates today or something. When you had to leave early in the afternoon to get to a game or even skip a day of school, which was rare back when I was in school. Because so you identified yourself to the faculty member as a as an athlete. I approached them, yes, and I, I told them what I was going to do. And in, in a few instances, actually one in particular, I went to a different political science lecture because I had missed my own because I was trying to make up the time, and I got an, an earful from the other professor, uh, who's whose uh, seminar I kind of invaded. And I was just sitting there listening and he told me, what for? He was very pissed off that I had missed my own class because I was a soccer player. Um, at the same time, I had an academic advisor, Helen von Schmidt, who was just really supportive and would tell me, you know, congratulations on your goal last week. Or, you know, she would follow me in the newspaper and, and uh, be very supportive and, and would rearrange things for me if I needed to when she was my thesis um, uh, advisor and just, again, a, a great mentor for me. So overall, I thought it was pretty supportive, but I did feel kind of this undertone, especially towards the male. The bigger guys that you just knew were football players. You know, they'd like walk into a room and you'd say, oh, those are the football players. And they'd tend to like, in this room, they'd tend to be sitting in that corner right there where that fella in green is back there. and. <laughs> And you know, like the 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 film professor would be kind of a jerk to them because I don't know why, but you know, it just felt like uh, they were a little segregated by the by the faculty as like you're not as important or you're not as serious about our academics. And I don't think that was true. And I think there was kind of a bias that may have pervaded even our own classmates, so that I may I may have had that same bias myself because of the culture at Amherst, which I, I regret. That, that some of my colleagues felt that way. I, I imagine they felt that way because it was palpable to me. Um, I think being on the crew team is just is different. Um, I never, we never had to leave early for anything. Sometimes we would sleep through class maybe, but we never had to leave early. Um, so mostly the faculty interactions were positive. I would say you know, not at all speaking for Bill right now, um, that I didn't feel we were particularly supported by the athletic department. Um, 
it felt it felt like we were a club sport and maybe that's by design um but we were sort of held at at arm's length for a lot of things um for example at the end of the year the when I was a captain my senior year I think we were kind of invited as an afterthought to um then it was President Garrity's house to sort of congratulate the captains on on the year gone by and it, it was sort of that that kind of afterthought treatment. Um, that said, you know, our boathouse was nine miles away or whatever it was, and uh, and what we were doing was really different from a lot of the other sports. Um, and maybe we just weren't visible enough to be, to be, I don't know, in the middle of everything else. But um, but yeah, we were sort of separate. Uh, let me let me just give you a, a little bit of history there as well. Um, it's ironic that crew was the very first intercollegiate team, but now it's a club sport. And it was in the early 80s when uh, we were going through one of our recessions that the budgets were frozen uh, within the college and most particularly within the athletic department. And so we had to make some cuts. And at that moment, uh, the athletic department decided uh, to uh, eliminate junior varsity programs and to uh, reduce skiing and club to uh, skiing and crew to the club level and thus um, crew moved on as a club sport so it was difficult to be a, a club not a, not appreciated as much by the athletic department to be a, a club sport athlete did you experience that gail in uh, in ice hockey uh, yeah, definitely. I, I also wanted to say one more thing too, but uh, to call it, to answer your question, yeah, I think I mean w no one treated it seriously, so I didn't treat it seriously. If if people had treated hockey seriously, I wouldn't have even tried out for the team. I mean, I was a very good athlete, so I taught myself how to skate, and I knew all the rules of hockey because I'd watched my siblings, um, and I rose up on, in the organization to maybe first line even, you know, as a winger on the first line. But I mean. I couldn't even begin to step on the on the ice today and play with the women that are playing here today. Our our first woman's coach, Chris Zampak, uh, came in from Lake Forest, and uh, she had a difficult job to do. Um, the recommendation from the athletic department, uh, when the decision to go coed was uh, the, the the discussion about it, um, the athletic department said we need to increase the staff by four. Uh, we need to improve our facilities, which have needed it for the last 40 years. And they appointed one woman uh, in a male-dominated department. Uh, and we had, um, all of a sudden, uh, I think we had four teams uh, for a year, and then it jumped up to 11 teams. Um, and we operated with the same size staff. Um, so it was a it was it was a, a, a difficult time for the athletic department, and I felt uh, at times that athletes were sort of pointing the finger at us, when in fact um, our hands were a bit tied. So you know we we tried to do as much as we could, and the method that we used to add women's uh, intercollegiate sports, um, soccer uh, was a club sport uh, from '76 to '78. 79 was our first season, and um, softball and hockey were in the um, 94, 95, 95, 96, I believe, became intercollegiate. And the way we, we added them was, could we sustain a, uh, uh, an interested group of committed woman, women over a three-year period of time? And that's how um, these, these other three sports uh, emerged. So just a little bit of a little bit of background. Can I make one more comment about um, lack of support for our team? When we were our our soccer team, uh, we had this beautiful field right behind Milliken, and the men had their field right next to the incline as you come down from the gymnasium, and in between there was the practice field, and that practice field was reserved for the men. When it was rainy, and you were tearing up the fields the men would practice on that middle field so that they could keep their beautiful field beautiful and we'd be hacking up our field in practices because the men got to to use the middle field so even in 1987 and 91 um, there was still this preference over the men and at that time i think the women's team may have been doing better than the men um, 
you know, in terms of num numbers of wins and losses. So that that was annoying and offensive, but you know, you kind of took that with a grain of salt, like the rest of the sexism that you experienced in society. I have to take some responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> I have to take some responsibility for that, for not being uh, an aggressive enough uh, member of the department, so my apologies. Uh, I think, I mean, I felt very supported by all of my classmates um, here at Amherst and the other athletes. I remember we had, when I mean, we had one home cross country meet every year, and um, we would send out emails and you know try to put up posters, and we usually had a good amount of people show up, which was really encouraging. Um, as far as the administration, um, some, yeah, I had mixed responses from professors. Some of them were very supportive and followed our accomplishments in the student paper and knew, you know, when we were going to be away and how we had done that weekend, which was amazing. Um, and then some of them were just not so pleased that we were missing class. Um, and then as far as the athletics administration, um, I, th I think the cross country and track teams, I mean, both men's and women's just felt a little bit more slighted by the administration than other sports, um, just because we're sort of, I guess, a less traditional sport in that we don't really require a lot of equipment, we don't have a practice field, we're not out there on the field, you know, running where people can see us, we're like out in the woods somewhere. <laughs> um, so I, I do remember uh, my team won a national championship actually in 2007, um, and I remember meeting uh, Tony Marks, the president at the time, but I think, like, I don't remember our team getting a congratulations from the athletic department. Um, and then I had other teammates who went on to win individual national championships or all Americans. And I remember some of them actually expressing um, that they were disappointed that they didn't receive a message from, you know, someone in athletics saying, Congratulations on your accomplishment. Like, you did a really good job. Um, just because I think, you know, the nature, the individual nature of the sport, um, I mean, the cross country team was always sort of a little more alternative, like not really the traditional uh, sports team. We're a little weird um, and not, you know, on a practice field in front of everyone. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure, you know, it's, it wasn't the same experience for everyone, but I think that was sort of the feeling, um, at least for me. So, Brianna, where are we today? We've come a long way. Uh, even in my four years, so when Gail was talking about the, the field being ripped up in the practice field, uh, my freshman year we couldn't have captain's practices outside because the O linemen would use our outfield to practice so they didn't have to rip up too much of their field. You know, there's some divots out there still that have not recovered, but that's okay. Um, so now they use the turf. Uh, we don't have to worry about our field being ripped up. We can use it to practice in the fall. Um, uh, every pretty much every like club sport gets to like or gets to works with uh, Coach Boyko in the training or the weight room now to do strength and conditioning. Um, and, like everyone has access to the training room and stuff like that. Um, and I think club sports have definitely become more recognized um, in that sense. Uh, faculty, I've definitely heard some horror stories from other people about uh, professors, certain professors who just aren't great with any sort of athletic anything. You could be the smartest, most hardworking student in the world and you're still knocked down a few points just for your affiliation. Um, I've never had any of those. I've been fortunate enough to have the professors who, when I come in on Monday, congratulate me for my two hits on Saturday and who actively follow and send emails or come to games when they're at home and it's not freezing cold outside. Um, administration has been very supportive and more so across my four years, probably because I got older and more involved in things. Um, and uh, for instance, like after, in the middle actually of Amherst Uprising, I stood up on a table and uh, said some things that said my contribution, my little bit, because I talk a lot, as you can tell. Um, <laughs> and I got a really nice email along with several other students from Maria Rello, uh, really just like congratulating us on like our, our confidence to get up there and do it and uh, also apologizing. For like for us ever, ever feeling that way, which obviously like, it's not her fault on her own, um, but went ahead and said it for the whole department. Was very supportive in that sense, and that was pretty incredible. Um, and I've I've felt that way uh, for quite a few administrators. We have Billy McBride come down to our field a lot, give us speeches on Wednesday game days, um, and Don Falstick. I feel like I'm bothering him with something new every week, but always responds in the best way and is very like very interested and invested in making sure our team. Uh, has everything it needs to succeed. So, doing good things. It's it's interesting if you see these these three um, trophies in the front. 
Uh, the, the little metal one is from 1979 uh, when uh, the women's basketball team, um, which I became coach of my very first year on the very first day of practice because Chris Zampak resigned from it that morning. Um, but we went on and won not the first division, but the third division of the NIAC term, uh, tournament, which was a conference organized for postseason opportunities for women. Uh, the next one, uh, the, the, the small plaque there, is from the 1990 women's golf team who were national champions, but it was not an NCAA tournament. It was a tournament that was sponsored by the National Golf Coaches Association. And I believe that it was the first national team championship. We had had individuals go on to NCAA championships. It's kind of ironic that the teams weren't allowed to do that. But, uh, and then the, uh, the gold one uh, is the very first NCAA championship trophy that the women's tennis team won in 1999. And it was the first Amherst team of either gender to win the national championship. Uh, Christina and, and uh, Brianna, how much eff emphasis is put on winning NESCAC conference tournament to allow you to go on to NCAAs and setting NCAA as a goal? Um, I, I think it was always a goal. It's a little different for cross country because you just have a certain number of teams that qualify. So I think actually anyone can run in our regional meet, our NCAA regional meet, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then it's the top three teams go to nationals automatically, and then there's at-large selections of usually between two to four teams from the New England region. Um, and while I was there, uh, the team made it to nationals every year, um, which was great. Um, and I think that's sort of been like the expectation, you know, you'll go to nationals because there's usually about seven teams picked out of regionals. Um, and I think, I mean, I think our coach sort of expected that we would go, um, so there, it didn't seem like there was a huge burden. We just sort of thought it would happen, um, which is a little presumptuous, but uh, I mean, I think there was a good amount of emphasis on just everyone sort of doing their best um, and having the expectation that things will fall into place if everyone you know, is ready to go and is working together as a team. Um, so. You're here. Um, the class that graduated last year, when they were freshmen, they went to regionals. Um, and so they kind of laid the groundwork. And we expected each year we would win, or at least you know, do really well in NESCACs and hopefully make the tournament. We didn't. Um, but every year we aimed to at least be at NESCACs and win it. Um, and this year we made it for my first time in my four years, um, down seven or eight girls. But we made it, and that, that was enough of an accomplishment for us, I think. So. How do you fit 40 years into an hour? You know, I, I have so many other questions to pick at these women for. But in, in closing, let me, let me leave you with this and, and one last question. Uh, in an article in The Student um, by Coach Cirrus, who was our longtime men's tennis coach and squash coach, in 1977, he referred to the tennis team as an enthusiastic and best-dressed and well-mannered team in New England. <laughs> In a 1981 uh, Friends of Amherst athletic newsletter, it was reported that the lacrosse team wins its first little three, and I was quoted as saying that, there were no that we were no longer a pushover. We've endured losing seasons, but we grew along the way. It was also reported that Coach Morgan brought a bottle of champagne and a little three mug to Williamstown in the anticipation of a possible little three victory. And God, if I ever did that today. <laughs> uh, Rebecca and Christina and Brianna have been part of a new century of women in sport across the board, uh, across the, all arenas in the world right now, where sports specialization has become the norm and multi-sport athletes have virtually disappeared. And as I told my team last spring when I announced I would be retiring, that we're all replaceable and new in different ways are good. However, as transitions occur, it's most important to maintain the things that are meaningful in your athletic experience and ensure that those things get passed down to the next class and the next class and the next class. 
So my last question for you is, could you each identify one thing from your own experience that you hope is still part of the culture and the traditions of our teams here? Can we Jump go in. from the other end first? <laughs> Brianna? <laughs> you go for it, Brianna. <laughs> um, I it should be fresh in your mind here. <laughs> yeah, you know, I just graduated. This is a big moment. Um, I think the one thing that I hope would stay within um, the athletic department, or at least female athletics, would be the continual growth, which is obviously like what we've all demonstrated. Um, and the, I think, sort of activism on the part of students and coaches and um, administrators to really push to make things better at all ends. Um, and really just not settling for any sort of low-end treatment in any regard. Um, so that's something I'm really proud of for um, this athletic department, and certainly for my team this year, and I hope that continues on. Um, I, I had a really amazing experience um, just being at Amherst and being part of a team, and I would count my teammates among my closest friends today. Um, so, And I know there's that sense of camaraderie on a lot of the other teams, so... I, I hope that's something that will, I'm sure that's something that, you know, will stay. Um, and then also it's great to see the improvement of facilities too. I mean, I didn't mention this before, but the track, the outdoor track, um, the new one is really nice because the old one had the football stands on the inside um, of the track. So we couldn't host any meets and our coach couldn't see us for, you know, half the track because the stands were obstructing the view. Um, so I'm really excited to go out and see the new Pratt Field and uh, see the track. Um, so I think, you know, little things like that make a really big difference. We just hosted the very first NESCAC championship because it's finally NCAA, meets the NCAA requirements. So anybody else have one? Um, just quickly, it, crew is can be really grueling, both um, physically and and sometimes emotionally, and I think one of the greatest things about the team was that the men's and women's team was sort of one team, and we did a lot of stuff together. We had a spring break trip that was was grueling in and of itself, but a lot of fun. We um, hung out together outside of um, practice. Some of us married each other, um, <laughs> and uh, and it was it it made the experience that much richer to to um, to do that together. Really quickly, yeah. um, I think that athletics and being part of that at Amherst uh, give a lot of people a home, um, a way to connect with other people and to be part of something bigger than themselves and work as a team. And it's a experience I think that is um, is powerful. And people in theater have it, and people in choral groups have it. And so activities as a whole is something that um, needs to be embedded and students supported to do their best in whatever um, activity they're pursuing, whether it's athletics or arts or whatever it is. Um, I think that the takeaway is for athletics is embedding it is a lifelong thing in, in your life as far as um, staying active, doing things, being healthy. It, it's all going to change over the 35 year difference here. But it's, um, it's important, and you always can meet people and, and do things with others by being involved. So, I've got to close it up. I can't thank you enough. You've allowed me to go down memory lane. Um, I thank each and every one of you for your commitment to our programs, and you've played, wherever you've been in your years, a very, very, very important role for all those future generations to come, and perhaps some of your own children. Okay, thanks so much for coming, everybody. Thank you.